think that is all I have to say. Uh, no, actually it's not. Well, we're back once again. I am wearing eyelashes that are too big for my face, so you're just gonna have to let them distract you while I tell you my opinions and why they're correct. Today we are going to be talking about your favorite childhood author, J.K. Rowling. Joanne Rowling has been caught up in some controversy, uh, to say the least, and we're gonna talk about it. But here's the thing. I could just sit here and tell you that J.K. Rowling is a turf, and J.K. Rowling is a bigot, and J.K. Rowling is a transphobe, and I do believe that those things are true, but if I don't really give you a nuanced explanation of why they're true, you may just not believe me and dislike this video and leave me an angry comment and go about your day. And you're totally welcome to do that, but hear me out. As you probably already know, the main issue concerning Ms. Joanne Rowling's controversy is transphobia, and you may be thinking to yourself, Matt, you're not transgender, why are you making this video? And I get that, but I am gay, and I do believe in community responsibility, and I do believe in amplifying issues that don't direct me personally, because I think we, first of all, owe that to the trans community. Second of all, the trans community within the larger LGBTQ community is facing higher rates of mental illness, suicide, and violence right now, so I think it's really important that we talk about the issues that are causing that. Also, as a cis gay man, I think it's important to use my platform to amplify the voices of people I know and love in the trans community, so I will be referencing trans voices throughout this video. I also am obsessed with being right all the time, so... In order to really understand what is going on here, I have to give you context, and that means looking at where all of this began. Like every bad thing that has ever happened, it started on Twitter. So, let's read the tweets. Basically, this all started when an article was published titled, Creating a More Equal Post-COVID-19 World for People Who Menstruate, which Joanne quote tweeted with, People who menstruate. I'm sure there used to be a word for those people. Someone help me out. Wumpen? Wimpund, Wumud, which are all deliberately misspelled versions of the word woman. Now, you might be reading this and off the top of your head you're like, that's not transphobic, but it's all in the context. The reason the original article uses the term people who menstruate is because it is deliberately trying to be inclusive of all people who menstruate, which can include non-binary people and trans men as well as cisgender women. ContraPoints, who is the best YouTuber, said it best, so I am going to insert her explanation of this here. Some medical organizations have recently begun using the term pregnant people instead of pregnant women. And in 2016, Planned Parenthood included the word menstruators in a tweet about the repeal of a tampon tox. This has prompted some conservative turf and Christian publications to post panicked commentaries warning that the entire concept of womanhood is being erased. But in fact, medical language that assumes that everyone with a uterus is a woman erases trans men or non-binary people who menstruate and get pregnant. So saying pregnant women in this context erases them, whereas saying pregnant people includes them and cis women and doesn't erase anyone. Now, JK Rowling understands this and she's smart enough to know what she's doing with this tweet. She knows that the original article is using the term people who menstruate to be inclusive of trans people who may not identify as women, but who menstruate. So immediately Twitter started calling her out and everyone was like, you're going out of your way to be transphobic. And then all hell broke loose for JK Rowling. Her next tweet said, If sex isn't real, there's no same-sex attraction. If sex isn't real, the lived reality of women globally is erased. I know and love trans people, but erasing the concept of sex removes the ability of many to meaningfully discuss their lives. It isn't hate to speak the truth. Once again, you may be reading this and you're like, how is that transphobic? She's not saying anything negative about trans people, in theory. She even says, I know and love trans people. But here's the thing, no one is saying that sex isn't real. Cis people, trans people, everyone basically agrees that sex, meaning the physiological characteristics you're assigned at birth, are real. Whether or not sex is binary is a whole other conversation that we don't have time for in this video, but basically everyone agrees that sex is a thing. What we don't agree on is whether or not sex dictates gender. I and a lot of other people believe that sex does not dictate gender, meaning you can be born as a certain sex and then realize later that my sex does not match my gender, which most people understand to be the meaning behind being transgender. But there's nuance here, because part of what Joanne is saying is true. There certainly is sex-based discrimination, a lot of which exists around periods and abortions for people who have experienced those things. But 
Joanne is kind of overstating the case because she's trying to frame the debate as trans people and people who are supporting trans people as erasing sex completely, meaning we can't talk about the experiences of abortion and periods and childbirth and things like that because they are erasing trans women. But nobody's really saying that. We can acknowledge the fact that trans women are women who may have different experiences than cis women like Joanne without invalidating the experiences of Joanne and other people who menstruate or give birth to children or have an abortion or anything like that. Joanne says it isn't hate to speak the truth, and that's true. But what Joanne's saying isn't really the truth. The truth is that yes, while people who are, for example, born with vaginas do face issues that are unique to being assigned female at birth, not all women face those issues and a lot of trans women don't. But also a lot of cis women don't. If womanhood is defined as, for example, having your period, then are women who no longer get periods not women? Are women who have gone through menopause not women? I totally agree that defining what it means to be a woman or a man or any gender is absolutely complicated, but to say what Joanne is saying here, which is that trans women are women, is erasing the concept of womanhood, that seems kind of extreme. Next, the idea that women like me, who've been empathetic to trans people for decades, feeling kinship because they're vulnerable in the same way as women, for example, to male violence, hate trans people because they think sex is real and has lived consequences, is nonsense. Here I think it's important to draw somewhat of a distinction between a traditional transphobe and a TERF. Joanne Rowling is what many people, including myself, would describe as a TERF, which stands for trans-exclusionary radical feminists. And basically, these are people who consider themselves feminists, they agree with a lot of basic feminist principles, but who basically exclude trans women from issues that women face and don't consider trans women to be part of the movement that feminism should be helping. I think when a lot of people think about transphobia, they think about really bigoted, old-fashioned people who just absolutely hate trans people, think they're gross, think they're not real, think they're disgusting, Whereas, people like Joanne agree that trans people exist and will use language that makes it seem like they support trans people, when in reality, a lot of the feelings that both of these groups have towards trans people are the same. So while it may be true that Joanne has felt kinship towards lots of trans people and the trans community even during her lifetime, doesn't really change the fact that she's pushing a hateful and harmful and dangerous narrative upon trans people. Next, I respect every trans person's right to live any way that feels authentic and comfortable to them. I'd march with you if you were discriminated against on the basis of being trans. But you're not marching with them and they are being discriminated on the basis of being trans. So, at the same time, my life has been shaped by being female. I do not believe it's hateful to say so. It's not hateful to say so. But why do you feel this need to distance yourself from trans people, especially trans women? I know I'm not a trans woman, but of the trans women I know and love and am close to, I've never met one who is like, oh yes, all of my struggles are the exact same as cis women, and cis women cannot talk about their unique struggles with being assigned female at birth, because that invalidates my own struggles. I know I'm saying struggles a lot, but bear with me. No one thinks that all women, trans or cis, or all people, trans or cis, deal with the exact same issues. But this kind of weird, divisive rhetoric you're using benefits no one. Like I said, you have every right to talk about the issues that affect you personally as a woman, Joanne, without saying that people who haven't experienced issues in that same way are not women. You know, J.K. Rowling is really smart. She's basically taking the things that she's saying and the things that she's implying that are hateful, watering them down into statements that are so vague that you can't really argue with them, and then saying, how is this hateful? A lot of these tweets, if you read them at face value, aren't hateful. But you have to read between the lines. You have to look at the context to realize the points that she's trying to make and the ways that she's trying to distance all cis people and all cis women from all trans people and all trans women and realize that the divisive rhetoric has dangerous consequences. And then she makes this tweet, which is kind of my favorite. She quotes an article from a website called The Velvet Chronicle titled, Anonymous Letter from a Terrified Lesbian. And Joanne quotes, I've never felt as shouted down, ignored, and targeted as a lesbian within our supposed GLBT community as I have over the past couple of years. So now Joanne's crusade against trans people has gone beyond her own concerns of womanhood being erased, and now she is 
uh, white knighting for cisgender lesbians and other cisgender queer women who apparently are terrified of the trans movement. <sighs> I'm kind of doubting Joanne's actual investment in the safety and security of lesbians because maybe if she was so invested in the lesbian community, she could have included one lesbian character in the seven Harry Potter books she wrote. I don't think the actual cause that she's fighting for here is for gays. I think she's picking a random article that she found from a gay person who wanted to disconnect themselves from trans people and is using this to make her point that trans people are not good. So while JK Rowling is tweeting all of these things, uh, a lot of Twitter is not having it. Paris Lees, who is a trans woman, wrote, There's just no evidence that me being me is causing problems for any of the other women I've met. If there are ever any problems between women and trans women, they should be dealt with sensitively and sensibly on a case-by-case -case basis. Please, for the love of God, leave us alone. And there were a lot of articles that were written in the mainstream press, is JK Rowling transphobic, and YouTube videos made, and Instagram posts made, including one by <clears throat> yours truly. And then JK Rowling came out with this. An approximately 3,000 word essay which she titled Turf Wars about why exactly she is a transphobe. I'm gonna save you the time of reading this entire essay, uh, not because I'm avoiding giving you the full truth of what she's saying, but because we just literally don't have time. I'll link it down below if you want to read the whole thing. I'm just gonna read you some excerpts that I found particularly uh, captivating. Let's get out my notes! The writings of young trans men reveal a group of notably sensitive and clever people. The more of their accounts of gender dysphoria I've read, with their insightful descriptions of anxiety, dissociation, eating disorders, self-harm, and, and self-hatred, the more I've wondered whether, if I'd been born 30 years later, I too might have tried to transition. The allure of escaping womanhood would have been huge. I struggled with severe OCD as a teenager. If I'd found community and sympathy online that I couldn't find in my immediate environment, I believe I could have been persuaded to turn myself into the son my father openly said he'd have preferred. Ooh, uh... <laughs> Basically, in this part of the essay, Joanne is talking about how she thinks coming out as transgender and starting to transition is a trend. And the point she's making is that maybe if she'd been born later into today's age of wildly leftist Gen Z kids who are obsessed with transitioning at whatever cost, maybe she would have transitioned to become a man too. And she's also implying that a lot of the trans men she's reading about online, she perceives as having only transitioned to escape womanhood. Here's the thing though, a lot of people don't love the social constructs of the gender that they're born in. Like, for example, I was born a man, and while I still identify as a man, I've really struggled to be comfortable in manhood and the idea that I'm a man. Patriarchy and the gender binary and gender roles aren't just oppressive for women. Of course, they're oppressive for women in a lot of very serious ways, but for men like me, who don't really fit the masculine ideal of manhood, it kind of sucks. But most of us don't abandon our gender just because we don't love it. Being transgender is a much more profound identity struggle than that. And for Joanne to say that maybe she would have escaped womanhood because she struggled with OCD, I think is really demeaning to actual trans people who oftentimes risk a lot to transition and live in their authentic truth. And perhaps the reason more people are transitioning now than before is because it is becoming more accepted. Not because people are bored and don't know what to do, so they transition. What? But as many women have said before me, woman is not a costume. Woman is not an idea in a man's head. Woman is not a pink brain, a liking for Jimmy Choo's, or any of the other sexist ideas now somehow touted as progressive. Moreover, the inclusive language that calls female people menstruators and people with vulvas strikes many women as dehumanizing and demeaning. I understand why trans activists consider this language to be appropriate and kind, but for those of us who've had degrading slurs spat on us by violent men, it's not neutral, it's hostile and alienating. So parts of this I can agree with. Woman is not a costume, and I don't think trans women think woman is a costume. That's why there's a difference between trans women and drag queens. 
Once again, I think ContraPoint says it best. My clothes, makeup, voice, none of this makes me a woman. No trans woman thinks that femininity and womanhood are the same. Rather, we're using a cultural language of feminine signifiers to prompt others to see us for what we are. Sometimes I get the impression that my cis girlfriends don't really understand why I'm presenting in such a meticulously feminine way. Like, they think I'm wearing ombre lips at 11 a.m. because I'm playing some kind of clout game, which I am. But also, if one person calls me sir, that's gonna ruin my day. So I'm desperately throwing glitter spaghetti at the wall in hopes the light catches some glimmer of womanhood. And when it comes to using inclusive medical language, how exactly is that demeaning and oppressive? No one is taking away your right to say woman. It's just in specific instances where inclusive language matters and is important and makes sense, the term people who menstruate may be used. I believe the majority of trans-identified people not only pose zero threat to others, but are vulnerable for all the reasons I've outlined. Trans people need and deserve protection. Like women, they're most likely to be killed by sexual partners. Trans women who work in the sex industry, particularly trans women of color, are at particular risk. Like every other domestic abuse and sexual assault survivor I know, I feel nothing but empathy and solidarity with trans women who've been abused by men. So I want trans women to be safe. At the same time, I do not want to make natal girls and women feel less safe. When you throw open the doors of bathrooms and changing rooms to any man who believes or feels he's a woman, and, as I said, gender confirmation certificates may now be granted without any need for surgery or hormones, then you open the door to any and all men who wish to come inside. That is the simple truth. I just have to say, when it comes to people being like, I love and support and respect trans people, but never a good sign. Like, you say you want trans women to be safe, but then you write a 3,000 word essay which perpetuates ideas that are literally causing the harm, so... And like, you're really almost there too. Like she says, trans women who work in the sex industry, particularly trans women of color, are at particular risk. And that's absolutely true. She's so close to actually using her platform to legitimately protect this very marginalized group. And here's the thing, on the bathroom debate. I live in New York City where we're like really progressive, we're really with it. It's pretty much unspoken here that in any public facility, whether it be schools or restaurants or public bathrooms, that you can use the restroom of the gender that you identify with. In fact, in my school, there are signs on the bathroom doors that say, please use the restroom of the gender that you identify with. And a growing amount of places have gender neutral restrooms, so there's also that. This is all to say that a lot of places in New York have made a conscious push to make trans people more comfortable when it comes to the bathroom issue. And there's been no notable spike of sexual harassment cases involving trans people using the bathroom they most identify with. Like, it's just not a thing in practice. We're already there. We're already letting trans people use the correct bathroom. And this myth that suddenly it's going to open the floodgates for men who just want to identify as women so that they can assault other women in the bathroom. Like, it's just not happening. That's not a real thing. And I'm not saying that it can't happen, and there absolutely may be some horrible, deranged predator out there who would use the situation to satisfy his own awful intentions, but really, people like that who are predators are gonna be predators regardless of whether the law allows transgender people to use the correct bathroom or not. I don't really think that's where that type of person is drawing the line. So excluding trans people from using the correct bathroom, I don't really think is stopping predatory behavior. I just think it's making the lives of trans people much harder. And then there's the book. Okay, you want to talk about the book? Let's talk about the book. Earlier this week, the LGBTQ news website, Pink News, reported that JK Rowling's latest book is about a murderous cis man who dresses as a woman to kill his victims. A new book penned by JK Rowling finds her private detective protagonist, Cormoran Strike, investigating a cis male serial killer who dresses as a woman to kill his cis female victims, according to an early write-up. Pause. I know that once again, you may be thinking, how is that transphobic? It actually sounds like perhaps a potentially interesting storyline for a novel. But again, look at it in the context. 
What is the narrative that J.K. Rowling has spent now quite a while trying to push about trans people? We know that Joanne thinks that at least a good number of trans women are actually just men in dresses trying to be predators. What may that tell you about the actual intentions of this book? According to an early review in The Telegraph, Troubled Blood, the fifth installment in Rowling's Corman Strike series written under the pen name Robert Gal Galbraith, 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 whatever, deals with the cold case of a woman who disappeared in 1974 and is believed to be the victim of Dennis Creed, a quote, transvestite serial killer. Transvestite is considered an outdated and derogatory term for cross-dressing, which is not the same as being trans. The review goes on to say, one wonders what critics of Rowling's stance on trans issues will make of a book whose moral seems to be, never trust a man in a dress. Now, I posted about the whole book situation on my Instagram, and some people who were quick to defend Joanne were commenting that the book is notably about a cisgender man, so maybe it is me who is falsely making the connection and saying that I think a transgender woman is just a cis man in a dress. But I obviously don't think that. Once again, I think it's about looking at the context of what Joanne is writing about and what she's already written about, and what she's made obvious her view is on trans people. Perhaps it is Joanne, and not me, trying to push the narrative that a trans woman is a cis man in a dress. And then there was this whole thing about her using the pen name of Robert Galbraith, which I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but just ignore it. Basically, Robert Galbraith Heath was the name of a 20th century psychiatrist who pioneered certain methods of anti-gay conversion therapy. What? The Independent called him the man who fried gay people's brains. Robert Heath claimed to have cured homosexuality by implanting electrodes into the pleasure center of the brain. Robert Colville reports on one of the greatest forgotten stories of neuroscience. But JK Rowling and her team were quick to deny any connection between her choosing this pen name and the 20th century psychiatrist. JK Rowling wasn't aware of Robert Galbraith Heath when choosing the pseudonym for her crime novels, a spokesman told Newsweek. Any assertion that there is a connection is unfounded and untrue. I actually do believe this, like, they gave kind of a long explanation on why she chose that name, and she does have a history of basically aligning herself with gay people, which is not to excuse any of her transphobia, but I don't think she chose this name to be homophobic. I do think it's like a shitty coincidence that doesn't really help her case. Once again, the reaction to the announcement of this book was, well, a non-binary trans femme person who I know and love, Alo, wrote on Instagram, I know that JK is hurting. I know that transphobia is unprocessed grief and repressed desire. I also know that injury has always been the justification for supremacy. I know that if we do not transform pain, we transmit it. As a brown trans feminine person, I'm not allowed to name my own pain. I am just a metaphorical device for others' pain. It feels like drowning in an ocean of text written in a language I will never understand. But I don't need to, because I am here, present in this body and in this burning world, and I can feel it. Another friend of mine, uh, Monroe Bergdorf, who's a trans woman, wrote, If transphobia is the future of J.K. Rowling's legacy, it's not going to age well. In writing transphobic fiction under the pseudonym of a gay conversion therapist, where the overarching moral seems to be never trust a man in a dress, she is revealing exactly who she is. The reality is that trans people exist, we have always existed, and will always exist. The reality is that trans people are more likely to be murdered than commit murder. The reality is that trans people are already navigating a hostile environment worldwide and this only adds to that hostility. In goading and fanning the flames of a traumatizingly toxic debate over our right to exist in public spaces, she has been doing so all along with the view of flogging this book. Hate for profit. So this is all a lot. And you may be wondering, like, okay, why do we even have to do this deep dive into Joanne Rowling's transphobia and my answer is transphobia has real life consequences for trans people and for humanity it was reported last month that the murders of trans people in 2020 had already surpassed the number of trans people murdered in 2019 in just seven months trans people especially trans women of color are some of the most marginalized people in our society another thing that happened recently was the attack of three trans women 
on Hollywood Boulevard in Los Angeles that went really viral. And of course there are ongoing conversations about the high rates of mental illness and suicide among trans people, which uh, I have to add is obviously not a result of them being trans, but as a result of the transphobia and the minority stress that trans people and queer people face in life. JK Rowling is an incredibly wealthy woman who also has an incredibly large platform. Uh, I believe she has 14 million followers just on Twitter. People like this have to do better. If you have not yet understood my viewpoint on the whole matter, trans people aren't posing a new or particularly high threat to cis people or to cis women. To say that is to catastrophize an issue that you're already misunderstanding, and to say so is also just putting trans people at a higher risk of all the things that are already disproportionately more likely to harm them. Do better. I think that is all I have to say. Uh, no, actually it's not. If you're watching this and you're trans, I love you, and that's actually just it. So much of my queer identity and how I express it has been informed by the incredible trans people in my life, and also it's not lost on me that so many of the rights I have as an androgynous gay man to be in public, to be proud, to love who I love, and to be who I am, those rights have been won by trans people, largely, once again, black trans women and other trans women of color. Trans lives matter, of course, but I also think trans lives should be celebrated and I think trans issues should be discussed in a way that makes the future world a safer place for all trans people and all queer people. That is all I have to say. I love you so much, thank you for watching, and goodbye.